Hi, this program is about both learning and putting that learning into practice. You'll learn how to change your thinking processes and your emotional reactions. Each day you'll have a morning contemplation and an evening meditation. The contemplation is to give you some ideas to think about, well, to contemplate on. In the evening, the meditation will be utilizing what you've considered from that morning, but it is for you to simply relax and listen to. You could think of these as one to learn and one to do, or apply that learning. Or even that the philosophy shows you the way and the meditation gives you the means. This is not a series of recordings that you just listen to, however. You will have to do some work. You'll spend some time deliberately considering key ideas. I'll guide you on a path that I know works. But it's your journey, and it's yours alone. I'll walk it with you, but no one can walk it for you. This contemplation is by way of an introduction, and while most of these will last seven or eight minutes, this one will be probably twice that long. Now, over the course of this program, we're going to, we're going to consider what is joy, what produces it, and what is currently stopping you from experiencing it. Together, we will put you in the driver's seat of your life, and you will be discovering joy. First, I need you to understand that joy is hugely depleted by living in survival mode. I'm not talking about your objective situation. Some people will be refugees living in a war zone and still be able to be in a state of joy, while others will be healthy, wealthy, living in a safe environment and be anxious or depressed. Now, I'm referring to the chemical state of your mind and body when I say survival mode, not your actual physical environment. You've almost certainly heard of the fight or flight response. It is essentially what happens when you perceive or believe yourself to be in danger. You can think of it as a switch to survival mode. All your internal alarms go off. You look around for both the danger and the means to escape or to hide. Your sympathetic nervous system is activated and your body gets ready for action. Your heart rate increases along with your blood pressure. Your digestive system stops to save energy. And if the threat is severe enough, can even empty itself from both ends. Cortisol and adrenaline flood your body and your immune system goes on hold. So again, that you have more energy to deal with a very immediate threat. You can get tunnel vision. Uh, now this will enable you to focus on the threat and you can even go deaf as your brain blocks out everything but what it perceives as the danger. Once the initial trigger has fired, there are actually five possible responses to this. Five variations of possible chemical balances and their corresponding behaviours. You might fight for your life. You might run for your life. You might fawn to placate a dominant or dangerous individual. You might resign yourself to a horrid death. Or you might freeze, not be able to move at all. All of these responses have evolved to deal with specific threats common to people over the last couple of hundred thousand years. In the modern world, however, the threats have changed. It's true that you might still fawn to a dominant human, um, think about the, the, the drunken father, the abusive partner, or the bullying boss. You might have to fight an attacker, that m may be real. You might run from a, a large herbivore, if you're thinking something like a bull. Or you might freeze when confronted with a carnivore, uh, maybe think about police dogs, that sort of thing. But more often than not, 
we are more likely to feel threatened by much, much more abstract ideas. Uh, the, the looming productivity target or the tax bill, the threat of a pandemic or a war, even if it's far away, the threat of redundancy, dangers that our hunter-gatherer ancestors never needed physiological systems to deal with. In the absence of something to actually fight or run from, we tend to freeze with lots of energy coursing through our bodies that has nowhere to be used. Some people will feel the physical symptoms of this um, and describe it as anger. Some will call it excitement. Some will call it anxiety. It tends to be perceived as a negative energy. Actually, we're waiting for something to happen that we can respond to. That, that's essentially what that energy is there for. That's what our body has prepared itself for. And we are in survival mode, having a, a physiological response best suited to hunter-gatherers with a large animal or other hominids to deal with. As a Kung Fu master, I've spent years teaching people to control and direct these physiological responses. You can probably imagine uh, all the martial arts skills in the world won't help in an actual conflict situation if you're, f if you're frozen still and you can't even move. Because we're in survival mode, our brain is looking for dangers and our thinking will be about how to respond, what to do, how to escape, to hide, to hide or to fight. And this is essentially what happens when we find ourselves worrying and troubled, even laying awake at night, um, going over and over different scenarios that might go wrong in the near future and what we could do about it. This is one of the greatest hindrances to feeling joyful. When we have no control over what happens and have no way of really knowing what might happen, we get lost in a downward cycle that can only be, exacerb only be exacerbated um, when we're too tired or when we can't think clearly because we're so tired. And you can't find any resolution so our anxiety and fear can only become worse. Eventually, after protracted periods of being anxious and waiting for that action uh, that our bodies are prepared for, we can become almost numb. Our alarm systems are being ignored. We are both tense for action while unconsciously blanking out the alarms. Negative energy with nowhere to go, aiming for a sort of emotional flat line. Now, using teaching from ancient mind control systems and modern neuroscience, I've dis distilled this system to work for you to control your thinking and your emotions. Think of this as Kung Fu for the mind, because that is where your fight is. You may have come across mindfulness or uh, meditation um, and found it a bit theoretical at best, over, it's been oversimplified, um, and, and it's been taken out of its original context in a way that is intended to make it easier for modern Western thinkers to relate to, but often actually has just made it sound a bit wishy-washy and vague. Perhaps your human resources manager, or your personnel officer, or even your well-being coordinator, it kind of depends on where you live, um, but they'll have read a book and prepared a PowerPoint presentation on mindfulness or something like it. But I'm guessing you left not really any the wiser. And you're here now listening to me because you still have an issue, yeah? So let me clear up one or two things about meditation. Broadly speaking, there are two types of meditation and you'll be doing a bit of both. In the ancient Middle East, an idea of meditation has come down to us from the Bible and the Quran. Um, and the word that's often translated as meditate le means literally to chew the cud. So animals like cows, for example, will eat grass and put it into one stomach for some level of digestion. And then later they regurgitate it and chew it over. This is called chewing the cud. 
and before they then swallow it again into another stomach. The idea is that you meditate on an idea that you have previously learned, but you bring it to mind, you chew it over, get more nourishment, more benefit from it. And in the Far East, we get the idea of meditation that means to sit and relax the critical mind, learning to not think. And this is quite different between the Middle East and the Far East in this sense. And this idea of just sitting and, and just stilling the critical mind, this will enable the total relaxation of mind and body so that it can repair, um, it can permit more internal communication even. I'm not going to list all of the benefits from tens of thousands of clinical studies that have been done on um, meditation in general, but I'm not going to list them here because, frankly, the fact that you're even listening to me um, on what is a, a meditation sort of therapy means that you already have some idea of the benefits. I am, however, going to mention one. And I think it's the most important one. So the number one benefit is that the very bit of your brain that seems to be most exercised and strengthened is the bit that enables you to pause between stimulus and response. I'll explain. So something will happen that would normally cause you to have a particular emotional response but you will have a moment in which you can recognize what emotion is about to fire and in that moment you've just enough time to choose whether to have that response or a different one and that is the most amazing tool. If you're the sort of person that likes some uh, some science behind what they're doing I'll, I'll try and simplify it a little bit but we are very mentally active um, when our critical awareness is working, shall we say, when our brain is producing beta wavelengths. Um, and when we're very anxious, we're in very high beta. When you're relaxed, and not especially engaged, when your brain is producing alpha wavelengths, as these alpha wavelengths get lower, you move into what's called theta. Now, Theta waves are typically what is often called hypnagogic state. It's a, it's a state that is, it's what you pass through between sleeping and waking or between waking and sleeping. When you're not quite fully awake, but you're not actually asleep. You're conscious, but not really thinking. This is perhaps the ideal state of brain in meditation, but typically you will find most meditation will be, will be done in low alpha. That's kind of the norm. Now, one reason that guided meditations work well is because most people find meditation difficult. It takes some practice, but it is a natural state and you definitely can do it. It's a bit like an exercise. You focus on something that is complicated but has no real meaning so like a flame or like the ripples on water um, and even a, a mantra something of that sort a word or a phrase this is again I'm talking much more sort of a far eastern type of meditation um, have you ever noticed how you can get totally lost in just watching an open fire or just sitting by the river just staring well, when we do it deliberately, we tend to find that our mind wanders. We notice the wandering and then bring it back. And then it wanders off and then we bring it back again. And we can start to get frustrated. Um, we get frustrated with ourselves and it seems to be, that only makes it harder as well, by the way. Um, before we find the self-criticism is, is just the very thing that our minds have become distracted by. Think of, it, think of it instead as, think of it like an exercise. So you do a chin up, you do a pull up. You lift yourself till your chin is above a bar and then you gradually drop down again. And we get to the bottom and then we lift up. Now, 
The exercise is the act of pulling back up. In the same way, the noticing of that our mind has wandered and then pulling it back to the mantra or the breathing or whatever the subject we're trying to focus on is, is the exercise of meditation. It is the very bit of brain that does that, that you are making stronger. So don't beat yourself up, just notice, pull it back. That is the bit of brain that enables you to have that pause between stimulus and reaction, that enables you to choose your emotion in any given situation. Now, the structure I'm going to use for these um, meditation therapies, these daily meditations, is based around an image called the Bagua. Uh, you don't need to know anything about it to use this program. But for those interested, I thought I'd just mention it. I find it makes a good map to evaluate character traits, and, and, and that's how I most often use it with our Black Belt students. It can be used like a sort of flowchart or thinking process. In Feng Shui, it's almost literally used like a compass. In this instant, I'm using it as a set of steps to take in um, developing a solid sort of strategy to go from controlling one's own thinking and thereby one's emotions and with that the ability to really take back control of your whole life. See, there's often some very good reason why some of these ancient ideas have persisted. So you don't have to understand the Bagua. I will mention just each of the trigrams that I'm referring to day by day so you can get a sense of the ideas and how I'm working through them. You'll be hearing a lot more from me and I think you'll find this will sort out some major problems in your life.